going to be in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 17 through 24, and then we're going to ask the Lord, amen, to help me preach His Word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. The Apostle Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, real quick, I, I wanted to say this, that I... Uh, I'm, I, sometimes I'm kind of a thematic preacher, like, you know, on Mother's Day, I like to preach a message for mothers, always preaching the gospel. I usually preach a Christmas message, you know, around Christmas time. So I think today was supposed to be a New Year's message. And uh, to be honest with you, I, don't, I didn't prepare a New Year's message, but it's always in God's word. Hallelujah. Amen. There's always something new. There's a new life Amen. in Christ. Amen. Amen. And, and you're about to get your New Year's message right here. <laughs> the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man. Amen. See, yeah. in the new year, it should be a reminder that there's a hope for the new man yeah. to show yeah. up. Amen. Yeah. Uh, that there's hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ always. For him to do a new work That's right. on the inside of our lives. Amen. Glory. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You know, I was kind of thinking about the message that I was going to be preaching. And I felt like the Lord had put on my heart this testimony that I remembered from whenever I was kind of a young boy. I, I can remember my sister, and I've shared this testimony with many of y'all before. But uh, I got when my sister, my oldest sister, got saved when I was about 13 years old. I use the story all the time to to as a witnessing tool. You know, whenever I'm talking to people in the world, to try to talk about the difference between religion and whenever a radical change takes place in somebody's life. And I've shared with y'all before how my sister showed up when at the house over there on Elmwood Street, not Elmwood. It was on in Normandy Circle um, in. Latin Lafayette, Louisiana, and if she didn't say Jesus 150 times in one sitting, she didn't say it one time, but the crazy thing was, was that that was something completely different, like we were raised in religion, and you just didn't say Jesus that much, so it was, and we, not saying that we didn't go through the traditions, we might have talked about some of the saints, we might have talked about, we might have thrown Mary's name around a little bit, but you didn't say Jesus that many times, and, and, and it was something that began to change things in my life Hallelujah. in a radical way. I can remember that I would go visit her and she would, on the way back from, she would take me from Lafayette. She'd come pick me up at, my, at you know, for mama's and she'd bring me to Morgan City. Me and my little sister would be sitting in the car and she'd stick these testimony tapes in the, in the cassette, boy. And she'd talk about, you know old preachers like R.W. Schombach, she'd stick him in there, and he'd have testimonies, and there was this one testimony, and I don't even know about the guy's theology, but I remember the story, and the Lord put it on my heart, so don't go necessarily look into what he's going to teach you, but, the, but remember that God shows up, amen, and it goes along with the word that Sabrina gave this morning, <clears throat> that uh, this man, his name was Gene Neal, and he, he used to have this uh, cassette called The Incredible Testimony, and he also wrote a book that I think it was called I'm Going to Bury You. But before he was born again, he was an atheist, and he had become a very successful attorney. Like he was a, a, an honors graduate as an attorney, but he began to work for the mob. He began to work for high, uh, very high dollar powerful criminals. And he was like an, a genius. And he would just happen, he could get anybody off of basically anything. And that's why he was like their top guy. And he would just happen to be, he would hang out with them at some point in time. And just the way his life kind of the turn it took. And he would overhear them sometimes scheming some of their plans. And he'd say, I don't think y'all ought to do, do it that way. And, and next thing you know, he's like kind of helping them plan things and whatnot. What do you think? Whenever everything fell apart, they ended up turning on him. Many of the people kind of blamed him. And he was sentenced to 50 years. 
And uh, he, he tells the story in there that he, he described the way that he felt the first time that he began to, uh, w w the first time he walked into the first prison that they brought him and how it seemed like he was just descending as every step that he took as they were bringing him to his cell, it seemed like he was literally physically, it was going downward, you know, and as he would walk through each door and the doors would slam behind him and each time a door would slam, he would feel more lonely, more forsaken, more hopeless in all of that that was taking place. And that you weren't supposed to have uh, any kind of reading material or anything like that, uh, you know, in this particular prison situation. This was many, many years ago. Prisoners didn't have near the rights back then that they do now. And uh, but nevertheless, a guard took a Bible and threw it in the cell and said, see in 50 years and closed the door. <laughs> Obviously, the story goes, I'm making it quick, that he became born again. Hallelujah. Uh, he cried. He's actually because I kind of looked it up this morning and I kind of read some of the information. And he said in there that that first night he knew he didn't believe in God before that. But he cried out to God and he said, I need you to do something. He ended up really, when it was all said and done, not spending much more than two years in prison. That's why he talks about this incredible testimony. All right. And so it wasn't even that very long that he was out of that one prison and he was in a, a lesser secure prison. And one day one of the guards comes up and he says, all right, Gene, your paperwork's done and, you know, it's time for you to go. And he was just <laughs> flabbergasted. He couldn't even understand it. And, you know, the truth, he said, I never once prayed that God would set me free out of that prison. Mm -hmm. He said, I only prayed for forgiveness, that God would change me. Wow. Amen. Yeah. And some, so we got Amazing. some people that kind of know what I'm talking about. I've been, I've done prison ministry before. And a lot of times people are like, pray that you get, that God will get me out of here. And I remember Robert used to tell me sometimes the best place for somebody to be is in prison, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because the, the Lord can get a hold That's of people. Right. Amen. He can, right. he can calm them down and slow them down. Anyway, I'm trying to talk about really, I'm telling this whole story just to talk about the fact that God wants to change people. Amen. All right. Amen. And. When he got out, his first job getting out was that he was a garbage collector <laughs> in Florida in the middle of the summertime. And he, he would he made the point that when he'd pick up those garbage cans, the juice would run down the back of his collar and down his back. And I mean, he was just it was like he was miserable. And he was like. You know, because look, anybody that's walked with the Lord for any length of time knows that sometimes there's some peaks and some valleys. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure he was ecstatic on the day that they told him he was going to get out of prison. And then after he's been in that job for a little while, it's like, what is going on here? And, you know, all of a sudden he would remember the time frames on the yachts and all of the, 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 past, the past life. But then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit right. kind of like tickled his heart a little bit and he kind of started to chuckle. And he said, OK, Lord, I see. I see what's going on here. You're, you're doing a work in me and you're humbling me and you're bringing me low so that you can bring me back up. Again. That was a changed man that God would be, amen, that God would be able to speak to him that way and do a work in him. And, and really and truly, I, that's what I want you to know is that God changes people's lives, amen? And most people that know anything about the Bible, though, that they understand that God expects his people to live their lives differently right, right. than after their right. conversion, after after God's gotten a hold of them than the way that they lived their lives before. That's the meaning of Paul's statement in verse 17 that we first read whenever he says, henceforth, and what that word means, it's an old King James word, but what it means is from this point moving forward, from now on, he says, walk not as other Gentiles walk. Now, don't get lost on me. Don't fall asleep on me, especially if you're a young person. What does a Gentile mean, preacher? We talk about this a lot. We're trying to break it down, right? Well, a Gentile is another way to say heathen. Well, what does a heathen mean? It means somebody that's not born again. Right. Somebody that's not saved. The truth of the matter is, is that if you've never been born again, if you've never been saved, then you are not, then the Holy Spirit does not live on the inside of your heart. Now, that is offensive sometimes to people. Because I've talked to a lot of people that have made the comment before, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just not one of them born-again Christians. 
Well, the problem with that is, is that now you're talking contrary to what the Bible says, because Jesus said, and I got the scripture in here, we're going to get to it. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, and he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So there's really only one kind of Christian, and it's the born again kind of Christian. Right. And when you get born again, a miracle happens, and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your life. And so when the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your life, you're not not like the other Gentiles. Right. Who were Gentiles? Gentiles were people that were from other nations other than the nation of Israel. So what does that mean for us today, preacher? Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. For the people of Israel, back in the Old Testament, they were the only people that knew the one true God. What does that mean for the New Testament Christian? It means that still today, God has always had a witness in the land. It means that still today, God has a people that are called right. by his name because he made the nation of Israel out of a man named Abraham. And from Abraham, he gave the world Jesus and Jesus took his perfect righteousness and died on a cruel cross and paid the penalty for mankind's sin. And now anytime that message is heard and a person is willing to bow their knee and surrender to that truth, they become born again and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of their lives and now they they become the people of God. Amen. Now, one of the things that people will say, well, wait, hold on a second. I thought everybody was God's children. <laughs> That's not true. The Bible teaches specifically that you're all God's creation. That's right. God created each and every one of us. But the Bible says very distinctly in the book of John in chapter 1, it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, that everything that was created was created through the Word, which was God, which was Jesus, because he goes on to say that it was Jesus. <clears throat> And he says this, he says that Jesus was the light that, he, that God the Father gave us in the midst of the darkness. And he said that to everyone that was willing to believe on his name, he gave them the power to be the sons of God. Now I'm just trying to be real clear here because I, I like to teach. Uh, it, well, I believe Jesus is real. I, I even believe Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says in the book of James, you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe, yet they tremble. See, the difference between believing with their head, even a demon spirit, whether you believe in that or not, is another story. But there are demon spirits that you cannot see. There are fallen angels that you cannot see that drive people to do things that are ungodly. And whether we believe it or not, they're real. And I'm here to tell you that the Bible says, listen, the devils have a cognitive or an intelligent understanding. What are you talking about? Whenever Jesus walked up on the scene and they saw Jesus, many times they would say, why have you come to torment us before the appointed time? Well, they knew who he was. They knew intelligently, cognitively, they had, they got some kind of a brain. They're, they're actually smarter than we are because they've been around longer than we have. And they know things intellectually. But just because you know something intellectually doesn't make you born again. A devil can't get saved. That's right. But you and I can believe from the heart. Hallelujah. See, what does it mean to believe from the heart? Jesus gave his life for you and he wants you to give his, your life back to him. That's right, amen. To believe from the heart and to confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And to believe that he died on the cross for your sin. Amen. Not just that he died on the cross for man's sin, but that he died on the cross for your sin. And some people may say, well, I just really wasn't all that bad, preacher. I never killed anybody. I never stole anything. No, 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 no. You were born of sin. You were born in Adam. I don't want to get ahead of myself in my message. We were all born in sin. That's why we must be born again. All right. So the Gentiles referred to other nations. They referred to other people that did not go know God at this time. And the Apostle Paul saying that you, church, ought not walk like the world walks. That's what the Apostle Paul is basically saying. To break it down and make it real simple, you, the children of God, that are born again and have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, ought to look different than the world around you. You ought not walk like they walk. They don't really know how to live their lives. You know, and we shouldn't really pick on the world. I mean, we really shouldn't. Because they just don't know. And if we're not telling them, we're not doing our part. Come on. They are in darkness. They are ignorant of the truth. 
Now, they may continue to refuse and reject and, and, and choose not to follow after God, and then that will be on them. But sometimes we, we expect sinners to act like saints. Right. Right. What the Apostle Paul's talking about right here is that the children of God would act like children of God. He goes on to talk about it in, 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 in verse 18. He says this, he describes them. I'm talking about the children of the world. The vanity of their mind. That means vanity means emptiness. And sometimes the word is used futility. It describes that the thoughts that they have in their mind, whenever God views it, it's full of emptiness. It has no real value. Right. You know, I don't know about you, but whenever I used to really be in the world, I was a mess. I know some of y'all weren't as much of a mess as me, and I thank the Lord for that, you know, for you, and, 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 and that you didn't go where I went, and, and you didn't do what I did, and, you know, all of that good stuff, and you probably feel a whole lot better about yourself than what I did. But, but nevertheless, I was a mess. I was bound with alcohol, bound with drugs, bound with all, all kind of stuff. And can I tell you that my mind was very empty regarding the things of God. Yeah. All I could think about when I was in the world was a little bit more sin. Yeah. Give me, just make my flesh feel good. Yeah. Give me a little something that's going to make me feel good. And, and constantly seeking after it, constantly searching after it, but never really finding what it was that I was right. looking for. Right. And so that was, that's what it was describing, the vanity of their mind. They have their understanding darkened. I like to really teach the book of Proverbs because one of the things that I realize is that knowledge, the knowledge of God has to do with the word of God. I know I got it in my phone right now, but I wish I had a Bible back here. I'd lift it up. The knowledge of God refers to the word of God. And before you're ever going to have any kind of wisdom, because wisdom refers to the application of God's knowledge. And then once you start applying God's knowledge in your life on a regular basis, you start to gain the understanding of God. You actually gain the ability to think a little bit more like God because your mind Mind becomes renewed and you start to learn the character of God and now you can begin to behave and walk in such a way that you can have understanding but the people in the world they don't have the understanding of God because they don't have the knowledge of God goes on to say because of this because they're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them they're ignorant about the things of God they haven't been exposed. Have you ever tried to talk to anybody that you work with or that you that you've just met in your neighborhood or whatever about the things of God? Have you noticed how and it's sad. I'm not I'm not saying this to be to be mean. How little that they really do know about the Bible, especially if you've studied the Bible. It's really sad. People are so confused about what God is, what his word says. Now, we've all been there. Every last one of us in this place has been there at some point in time in our lives. Yep. Right. And but it goes on to say because of the blindness of their heart, you know, one of the main truths, though, that I wanted to point out, too, is that we learn with time as we walk with God. In other words, change doesn't happen overnight. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a miraculous conversion experience that happens in the life of a true child of God. What I'm trying to say is, is that I told y'all the story before, but that night I went to church with my sister for the first time. And that woman preacher, that's why I love women preachers. That woman preacher started preaching about the blood. And I, I, keep, I, I know I keep telling y'all this story, but I can't forget it, that she kept talking about the blood. And I felt so uncomfortable because I'd never heard anybody say the word blood that many times. And the, and the devil was trying to like cause confusion in my head. And I was like, why does she keep saying blood? Why does she keep saying blood? And all of a sudden she turned around and she said it different and she said the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one and she stopped the service and she said somebody in here the Lord's dealing with your heart you better come up here and give your life to the Lord boy look I got up there my long hair flowing in the wind I bowed my knee I said Jesus I'm a sinner and I need you to save me so there was a and look when I stood up I'm telling you right now I felt like a cement sack fell off my body oh the burden was lifted a miracle that fast. But I got to tell you something. Like Brother Larson always says, you don't have to know much to get saved. You just need to know you're a sinner and that Jesus is the Savior and he died for your sin. But you're going to need to know some things. You can't remain ignorant, lacking understanding with blindness of your heart regarding the things of God and continue to walk and live for God unless you begin to learn some stuff. So don't talk to me about we get too deep in here because we need to learn the word of God. There's a, there's a process of time. 
Sanctification takes time. What is sanctification? It's a, big, it's a church word, but you know what? I love that word. Because it means that we become separated out. Just like the Apostle Paul said, henceforth, from this day forward, do not continue to walk like the other Gentiles walk. In other words, when you become sanctified and you walk in the process of Christianity, God begins to change you so much on the inside that it begins to be manifest on the outside and you begin to look different than the world around you. Separated out, made holy, not because you do everything right. Come on, church, help me out here. Right. Made holy because you've been separated out in Christ and the Holy Spirit's now in you and he's working in you if your faith Amen. remains in Christ and what he's done for you at the cross and he continues to change you on a daily basis. Grace doesn't work on the inside and it becomes manifest on the outside. There's a process of time that has to take place in our lives where we begin to more clearly understand what God is saying in his word, which helps us to better learn how to depend on him instead of ourselves for help. Paul says this, he says, but you have not so learned Christ. In other words, if you're continuing to walk in darkness and you're continuing to run after sin, Jesus didn't teach you that. Right. Really, the word learned Christ talks about the whole, according to one Greek scholar, talks about the whole body of truth regarding Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. To gain a revelation of what it really means to be in Christ. To gain a revelation that the whole plan of God, you got to stick with me on this. The whole plan of God from the time that, that the fall first took place and God told Adam and Eve in the garden uh, and told the serpent, he said, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. <laughs> He's talking about how the power was going to be, how the enemy of mankind was going to be defeated through the crushing of his head, the ripping away of his authority, because Jesus would ultimately die on the cross and defeat the powers of darkness. And from that day moving forward throughout the, an the annals of human history, as God created this nation called Israel out of this man named Abraham, he gave the promise to Abraham, he gave the promise to the tribe of Judah, he gave the promise to King David, and he, made it, he caused it to be manifest in Jesus, and what Jesus did at the cross, it was fulfilled in what the Lord has done. The baby wrapped in swaddling clothes that was born that we preached on last week whenever the shepherds heard the angels sing peace on earth, goodwill towards men. All of that, when that baby, when those wise men finally made it to where Jesus was, you know what they brought? They brought, brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Even in the gifts that they gave, even in his birth, we see the truth that Jesus was born to die. Uh, Myrrh was used to embalm dead bodies in those days. And what I'm trying to tell you is this. It's always been God's plan yeah. that Jesus would be the fulfillment of the sacrifice. Because you and I were guilty. And the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. And I know I've already said it twice, but I'm going to say it again. That whenever you believe that true story and you believe it from the heart, a miracle can happen in your heart and you become born again and the Holy Spirit will come to live on the inside of you. You have not so learned Christ to keep living the way that the other Gentiles live. If indeed you have heard him. Yeah. In the, in the Greek language, the idea is if it's really true that you have heard him, if it's really true that you've truly believed this gospel message, then you haven't learned of Jesus that way. Unless somebody's been teaching you that. <coughs> That's unfortunately still alive today. You have not been taught that by him. It's clear from the word learned also in the Greek language, the meaning of it. It doesn't just mean to increase one's knowledge, but look what it says. To learn by use and practice. Do you realize that there takes there, there has to be an experiential knowledge? I don't mean to get all fancy on you, you know, this early in the morning. But there's this one word. There's a couple of words for knowledge. And I just kind of like, you know, go with it. But there's a couple of words for knowledge in the, uh, in the Greek New Testament. And gnosis just means information or knowledge in general. That's where the word Gnosticism comes from, but, but, but nevertheless, it just means knowledge, all right? But this word right here is epi, that's a preposition that means upon. 
So it's above just regular informational knowledge. It's actually, the meaning of it though is this, is that there's an experiential aspect to the knowledge. Yes. Yes. For, in order for you to learn Christ, you gotta walk this walk out, you gotta learn the informational knowledge, and as you go through the trials of life, you have to take the mixture of the trials that you're living in, along with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you have to learn how to depend as you've learned of Him, how grace can flow in your life, and you will become dependent upon the Lord and the way that he works. Amen. And that through that grace, you will no longer have to continue to walk as the other Gentiles walk. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. There was only one who was sinless. I'm sorry. There were two who walked on the earth without sin. Well, three. Eve to two men, two men that walked on the earth without sin. Hold on a second. I'm not done. But only one died that way. Only one died that way. Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. And when he was first created, he had no sin in him. But Adam fell. And he's the fountainhead of all humanity. All mankind that has walked on the face of the earth comes forth as his children from his loins, so to say. You are a child of Adam and born of Adam in your physical birth. You were born in sin. I got good news, though. Jesus came from the Father. He was from incorruptible seed. Hallelujah. He had no sin in him. And when he died, he was without sin. And that's how I know that he was without sin because the Bible says that he resurrected on the third day. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But because he had no sin, death had no right to hold him down. And he came busting out the grave. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Three things that have changed in the life of the Christian according to this passage. You ready? Point number one, you're no longer dead. Amen? Amen? I want you to know this morning that you're no longer dead. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22, he says this, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Now, what I need you to understand is, is that when Paul talks about the old man, what he's talking about is the person that you were when you were born the first time from your mom. Because when you were born the first time, you were born with your physical birth. And essentially, the Bible would say you were born of Adam. And you were born into sin. So I got, you know, the, you know what the word gospel means? Good news. Good news. Good news. But every time before there was good news, you got to know that there was bad news first. The bad news was that mankind was fallen in Adam and mankind is in sin. But good news, good news. The father has a plan. Hallelujah. And he sent us Jesus. But I, the, why did I say all that? Because I wanted to make the point that don't feel like the preacher's preaching down to you. Don't feel like if you came in here this morning, you're like, man, he done said the word sin 25 times and I'm feeling condemned. That's just the way I talk. I'm just trying to be real. Amen. And, and all I'm trying to say is, is that I was born the same way you are. I was born the same way you were when I used to go to the jail and preach in the jail when, when, when I had more time. I would tell those guys because only like certain amount would come up and I would say, I would say, look, guys. You may not agree with everything that I'm going to say, and we might not even agree on Jesus. We might not have Jesus in common right now, but I'll tell you one thing we do have in common. We were both, we were all born in Adam, we were all born in sin, and we've all experienced the pain of sin, and we've all experienced the destruction of mankind. And they'd be like, yeah, you got that right. <laughs> and, and, and all I'm trying to say is this, is that we were all born in the same boat. But because we were born of Adam, the old man... Born dead, that's why we must be born again. That was point number one. I needed you to know you're no longer dead. Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, if you have your Bible with you. Because I wanted you to, I, w I just wanted to clarify the point or, or emphasize the point that I just made. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. It says, And Adam lived 130 years. And he begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. Now, the point that I'm trying to make right there is this. The Bible teaches us that when God formed Adam and created him, 
that he made him in his image and likeness. Before the fall, Adam looked like God more than any other man until Jesus showed up on the scene. Amen. But Adam fell into sin. And after that, his offspring came out in the image and likeness of Adam. A change took place on the inside of man because of the fall of Adam. Adam's fall caused a change to the nature of man. Look at Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 12. It says, as it is written, this is the Bible. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. What he's talking about there is that outside of the plan of God, outside of the grace of God, flowing and changing people's lives, mankind left to himself is not going to run after God. Right. Mankind left to himself is not going to seek after God. Amen. No man is going to be holy in and of his own self. The only way you will ever be righteous, the only way you will ever have a hunger for God is if the Father first draws you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the things that I learned growing up, because I was in three different rehabs by the time I was 19, is that society and psychology will try to teach something different right. than what the Bible teaches. Right. Come on. Psychology and society will try to tell you that you're really not all that bad after all. <laughs> and that really and truly all we got to do is, 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 is uh, you know, rehab you a little bit. Just do a little work on you, kind of fluff you up, make you look pretty. Do a work on the outside. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Right. The Bible teaches that something must be done on the inside. Something has to change on the inside of our hearts. Right. Amen. The Bible talks about the fact in Isaiah that all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own ways. But look, this is God's plan. But the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all upon Jesus. Yeah. So according to the Bible, we've all turned in the wrong direction. But the reason that we are all guilty of wrong direction is because we were all born of Adam, dead in sin. But in Jesus, we've been offered new life. Amen. Amen. I want to just share a couple of scriptures with you about new life because you're no longer dead. I want you to know that this morning. Yes. Amen. Put, put a smile on your face. I, I, know, I know I've been rough this morning, but put a smile on your face. Amen. Uh, th th you're alive from the dead. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, and you has he quickened. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. It means he gave you life. You has he given you life who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then in verses 4 and 5 it says this. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. Yes. You can stop right now and you can think about the worst sin that you ever thought that you ever committed. And what I need you to know is right there, right then. When you were your worst, Jesus died for you. That's right. Yes. It says that he has quickened us or given us life together with Christ by grace are you saved. What I need you to understand about being born again also is this, is that the first time you were born like Adam and you were born dead. But when you heard the gospel and you believed by faith, you know what happened in that miracle? God, the Holy Spirit took you and he put you over here in Jesus. Amen. And he allowed you together with Jesus to die as the old man, to be buried in the tomb with Jesus as the old man, but to be resurrected yes. to new life with Jesus as the new man. Born again of Jesus. That's why Jesus said it. And I told y'all I was going to use the scripture in John chapter three, verse six. He said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The first time you're born of Adam, you're born in the physical, you're born in the flesh. And he says that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When you're born again, something spiritual is happening on the inside of you. Then, then, then Jesus said this in John 3, 3. He said, Jesus answered and said unto them, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's how we receive new life. It was through a new birth. 
But that brings me to my second point that I wanted to preach to you this morning. Because I wanted you, you remember what the Apostle Paul said? They don't have any understanding. Their mind is empty. They have blindness of heart. I wanted you to know that not only are you no longer dead if you're a Christian, but you also, you're no longer blind. Amen? Yeah. The word spiritual blindness, though, there, it's, it's like, it's talking, it's really the idea in the Greek is a callous. You've allowed your inner man to become hardened and you can't see the things of God. You know, there was a miracle in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, there was a miracle where there was a blind man and the disciples asked Jesus this. They said, whose fault was it that this man was born blind? Was it his parents' fault? Did they commit some kind of sin or was it his own fault? And Jesus said, neither. Now, Jesus isn't saying that sin doesn't cause physical disease because that would be contrary to the whole word of God. What he's trying to say is, is that it's not because of any specific sin that this man was born blind, but instead so that the power of God could be manifest. Jesus went on to say this. He said, as long as I'm here, I am the light of the world. He said that he said, and I have come to do the work of God. He said, but the, but the night comes when no man will work. What he's talking about is that there's a certain set time frame of him on earth to do his work. And then the Holy Spirit came. And then there's the church age where there's a certain amount of time for us to do the work of God before God calls his church home. But ultimately what that miracle is all about, stick with me here, is that he came to show us that he's reversing spiritual darkness. That whole miracle is like an illustration. Yes, it's a true miracle that really happened, but it's a spiritual illustration that Jesus came to reverse darkness. And where that blind man could not see, now he can see. And when you get born again, the Bible says that you can now begin to see, hallelujah, the fact that there is a kingdom of God upon this earth. I don't know about you, but for so long in my life, I was blind to the fact that God was real. I was blind to the fact that spiritual things were going on around me. And I just thought that things happened just, just for happening. Jesus is saying that there's a spiritual disease that causes spiritual blindness. And the miracle that he came to perform is that his light has reversed darkness. And until a person is born again, they're going to be blinded to that fact. They're going to be blinded to the fact that Two, that, there, that, there's two that there's two kingdoms on the earth. Did, did you know that this morning? Two kingdoms. Kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And many times, people don't even realize yeah. that they're being bound mm -hmm. right. by the kingdom of darkness. They don't even understand why they find themselves falling into the same old trap time and again because they're blind spiritually to that. But when you get born again, not only are you born again from the dead, but you're also no longer blind. It says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, the Apostle Paul says this, We give thanks to the Father, which has made us meet. That's another way to say it. He's made us worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Hallelujah. And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Listen, when you get born again, you were born the first time like Adam and you operated in the kingdom of darkness. But when you get born again, the Holy Spirit now has translated you from one kingdom into another kingdom where darkness becomes dispelled, where the light of God begins to open your spiritual eyes and begins to give you revelation of God's truth and God's kingdom. Ephesians 1.18 says this, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. The first time I read that after I could actually understand the Bible, I was actually amazed because I was like, I didn't even know that my spirit man had eyes. Right. The Apostle Paul saying your spiritual man couldn't see. But whenever the word of God enters into your heart and you get saved and the Holy Spirit makes his heart your home, your spiritual eyes can be opened up. Amen. And you can begin to see that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, that you would know the plan of God. Hallelujah. And that it would be able to that you'd be able to be excited about the things of God, that you'd be able to see the things of God. Look, when we're born again, our spiritual eyes are opened and the light of the Lord allows us to see. 
That brings me to point number three. I'm getting close. Bear with me. Point number three is this. No longer ignorant. You were no longer, you're no longer dead. You're no longer blind. And guess what? You're no longer ignorant. The Apostle Paul, look, look, I always use my brother-in-law. Fortunately, he stepped out right now, so he, he won't feel weird about it. But I always use him as an example. And I know I've told y'all this story before. And if y'all get tired, that tired of my stories, then, you know, I guess that, that's when it's time to move on. Right? <laughs> get you a new preacher. But what, I, but what I wanted to say is this. Hopefully you don't get that tired of this. <laughs> is that he told me one time, we were in an argument. And he said, you're, he said, you're ignorant. And dude, when he said that, I was like, because we were already arguing. <laughs> and it was like, all of a sudden, man, this anger came over me. And, he's, and he said, you're ignorant. He said, oh, no, ignorant is not a bad word. It just means you don't know. <laughs> and it was true that what he was saying, that was the definition of it. But he was mocking me and trying to <laughs> incite anger in me. But I'm not trying to do that to you. Amen. I'm just trying to say that before we get saved, we're ignorant of the things of God. We just don't know. We need to be taught the things of God. We need to be made aware of the things of God. And that's point number three. The Apostle Paul said this, that you would put off concerning the former conversation. That word conversation is an outdated King James word. What it means is your conduct or your lifestyle. The way you live your life. The way you handle your business. That you would put off that former way of living, which was the old man, which was corrupt according to deceitful lust, and that you would be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then he talks about the fact that you would put on the new man. Amen. I wanted to share this with you about ignorance. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10 says this. What God's talking about in Hebrews 3 verse 10 is that He's, 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 this is actually the, the author of Hebrews. I'm not trying to confuse you, but the author of Hebrews is quoting Psalms and Psalms is quoting something that happened in Exodus. And what he says is God says this about his people. He says, I was grieved with that generation. What generation is, do you think he's talking about? He's, he's talking about when they were in the Exodus and they were wandering, wandering around in the wilderness. And he says, I was grieved with that generation. And he said, and, and said, they do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. The, so God was saying, I was grieved with that generation of my own people because they always had error in their hearts and they didn't know my ways. Now, one of the things, and I'm about to wrap this up, just, just bear with me for a second because I think that this is good. And I know I've shared this with some of y'all before, but one of the things that I began to ask the Lord, Lord, why were your own people called by your name <clears throat> unaware of your ways? Th does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Like, in other words, if we're the people of God, they were the people of God. They had the word of God. They, had, they were a nation that had been created out of Abraham. If anybody should have known God, it should have been his people. Why did they not know God? Why did they not know his ways? That's why I go through all the trouble to draw a chronology on the board so that we can all be trying to be on the same page. And if you'll know that when they were in the Exodus, right, that, that they, where had they just come out of? Egypt. That's exactly right. Well, what is Egypt? As far as for the New Testament Christian, it's a type of the world. Pharaoh, a type of the enemy. Uh, Egypt, a type of the world. The Passover lamb, a type of Christ, the Hallelujah. fulfillment of the cross, hallelujah, or the, the precursor to the cross. And the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that God's children had been Egyptian slaves for 400 years. They had been in the world for 400 years. The truth of the matter is, is that many times God's people still today remain ignorant of the ways of God because the world has crept into the church and the truth of God's word has not been taught properly or we as the children of God. Now, I'm about to start meddling with you now, so if you won't get aggravated, this is the time to do it. We have not put the work in. I'm not talking about working for your righteousness. I'm talking about putting the work in to learn the word of God for ourselves. That's right. How can we walk with God? How can we know the ways of God if we ourselves have not learned about the things of God or about the word of God? And if we remain ignorant of God's word, then we will err in our hearts. And that's what happened in the Old Testament. 
They had been Egyptian slaves. They had not. Listen, how, well, come on, preacher. I think you're stretching a little bit. Well, hold on a second. I mean, for some of you, you, you know, you may not understand what I'm about to say. But the Bible says that they literally were walked for those 40 years uncircumcised. There's another spiritual truth there for the New Testament Christian. Because the Apostle Paul, what does circumcision mean? Look, we're not trying to get weird here, but the word circumcision is all throughout the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament too. It was a sign of the covenant that they had with God. The cutting away of filthy flesh through the shedding of blood, which is a type of... Of what Jesus does on the cross. And the reason I can tell you that is because in the book of Romans and in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says there's a circumcision that is made without hands. Yeah. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit does a surgical procedure, if you'll allow me to say it like that, on your heart. Right. A surgical procedure where he begins to remove the flesh of the inner man. Israel in the Old Testament walked literally in the flesh for 40 years. They did not circumcise themselves till they got ready to cross over the Jordan River. So essentially you could say if you compare that to the New Testament Christian, there are Christians still today that are still walking in the flesh. Yep. Come on somebody. As a matter of fact, if we're honest with one another, we all yes. still. I like the way Brother Larson used to say that. A lot, the truth is, is that all of us are a lot more flesh than we really are faith than we give ourselves credit for. We think we're more of faith, but in reality, we have a whole lot more flesh in our life than what we really want to admit to in <coughs> situations. I mean, right? I mean, I mean, if we're, if we're honest with one another and we think about some of the thoughts that we think, some of the things that we say to other people, some of the ways that we respond and we react to other people. Come on, somebody, help me out. You know, whenever somebody does something that we don't like in the way that we respond, instead of responding in the love of the Lord, we respond with a sharp, critical word that, you know, and listen, I'm not once again trying to say that, but we, we should be convicted of that. That's right. Amen. 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 We should be convicted of that kind of thing. We should be asking the Lord to change us on the inside. Right. Praise God. Amen. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to purposefully frustrate people, do you? Because if you do, then you're out of God's will. <laughs> Amen? If I do that, I'm out of God's will. If you're going around poking people in the eyeball and stepping on their toes, you are out of God's will. I used to like the way Robert used to say it all the time. We're having fun this morning, right? We love each other, man. We're fellowshipping. I used to love the way Robert used to say it all the time because sometimes, like, I don't know. Well, a couple of times it was my fault because I mean, somebody else got into like a heated discussion in Shoney's. And, like, he was talking to somebody on the phone one time and they were going through a drive through and the person just gave that girl in the, in the booth a tongue lash. And, and I can remember Robert told me, he said, man, I told him, can you go back and talk to her about your Jesus now? <laughs> That's a good word, though. You know, and we should think that way. Will you be able to go back and minister to that person that you just treated the way that you treated them and said the things that you said to them? Are they going to be interested in the Jesus you serve? I mean, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to say, because Lord knows if anybody's done it, I've done it. But Lord, I need you to change. Amen. I need you to do the work on the inside of me. Right. And so what he's talking about right here when he says be renewed in the spirit of your mind, God wants to begin to change the spirit of your mind. And the reason I used that Hebrews text was to make the point that God's people still can walk in the flesh at times. And also wanted to make the point that God's people in, in Egypt had been enculturated to the Egyptian ways. That's why they were no longer circumcised. That's why they they didn't know the ways of God. They weren't serving God in Egypt. They instead were slaves of the world. And the reality of it is, is that if we're not careful, we can still, listen, if we allow the world in our lives, you will remain enculturated to the world. Yes. I'm not trying to tell you that you're, that, you know, you, listen, sometimes I forget my earphones and I need to quit doing it as much and I end up in the gym and, you know, I've got to the point where I turn, I, I turn, tune the music out. But what I, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that sometimes we can get so legalistic that we freak out and we're like, ah, I, you know, like freaking out to the point that if I accidentally hear something, I'm not telling you to go purposefully turn it on. Right. Because, it, and, you know, whenever I grew up and got, first got saved, and I tell you all this all the time, but I'm going to say it again. Because when I first got saved, the preacher said, you ought not listen to, to worldly music. But they never really gave me a reason why. And I'm here to tell you, you ought not listen to worldly music. <laughs> and, and let me tell you why, though. 
<laughs> because the music of the world preaches a message. That's right. Amen. Our music should preach a message. That's it. Amen. You are the righteous one. You are the holy one. You brought light in the midst of darkness. Jesus, I love you. Amen. It should be preaching the message of Jesus Christ. But the message of the world also preaches something. Right. It, it preaches a message that talks about the fact that, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I gave you all this example before. There was a, a, a popular country and western song uh, quite a few years back whenever I taught this. And that country and western song actually um, made the comment in there that uh, he, this old boy was going through some stuff. And he said, I think I'm going to sit down on this pier right here. And I'm going to have myself a beer. Well, can I tell you that that ain't going to fix nothing. That's right. That ain't going to help nothing. But that's the message of the world. If you go on through something, you just need to go ahead and just have yourself a beer and numb your pain. You know, the Beatles came out with that song way back in the day. I know y'all too, too uh, young to know about that. But it talked about she goes running to the shelter of her mother's little helper. And it was talking about a little blue pill. It was, it was talking about value. All the house mother, all the housewives were on value back in the day, and they're they singing about it. The point that I'm trying to make, oh, there was another song where that girl says, let your heart be the compass. And they asked her what it meant and said, well, I mean, you know, whatever your heart wants to do, you just need to go ahead and follow your heart. Well, that's a lie from the devil. Yep. Jeremiah the prophet said, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You follow the compass, you follow your heart like a compass, and you're gonna find yourself either in prison or in a grave or somewhere where you ain't supposed to be. Because the heart of man does things and desires things that are not of God. And until we get born again and the Holy Spirit comes to live in our heart and we begin to allow the message of Jesus Christ to infiltrate our hearts. So I don't really care if you don't like Christian music and you like the way the world's music sounds better. But I'm here to tell you that it's not of the Lord. For you to continue to listen to that stuff. And let me tell you why. Nowadays it's even worse. Right. I mean the stuff I used to listen to like Motley Crue. They were talking about drinking whiskey. And, and doing all kinds of stuff they had no business doing. And, and you know singing about all these kinds of drugs. Nowadays and, and, the, and I'm just going to say it. The, you figure it out. The music industry talks about how they're going to. We treat women any more way we want to. We don't get things the way we don't. We, we want to get it. Then we pop, pop a cap in you. It sings about <laughs> violence. It sings about sex. It sings about all kinds of garbage. Yeah. And listen to me. You ain't even got to find it. It ain't going to be hard to, to find it. Trust me. You can't shelter yourself. It's everywhere out there. Everybody right. is listening to all that stuff. I'm either telling you the truth or I'm a liar. And I'm here to tell you. I'm telling you the truth. That's the message of the world. And it ain't coming from the Lord. The Lord doesn't want men to treat women like pieces of meat. The Lord doesn't want men uh, to, to go after things that are going to destroy their lives. No. That's the devil, brothers and sisters. That's the devil that wants men to treat women and to, and to, and to cause destruction in their lives so that they grow up to, to you know, to bring more pain upon themselves. That's the devil that causes people to try to numb their pain through drugs and alcohol to cause more pain in their lives. That's the devil that causes people to make the wrong decisions. And now we're in the midst of Hollywood and almost every TV show, homosexuality is perfectly normal. Now. Right. <laughs> Much less sex outside of marriage. Every... Completely contrary to the word of God. What's the point you're trying to make? I'm going to bring you back. The children of Israel walked in the flesh for 40 years. Yeah. Sometimes God's people are still walking in the flesh. Yeah. Because they are allowed. That's a, that's a form of walking in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. We teach always that you can't put your faith in how much you read your Bible, how much you go to church, because then you're putting your faith in your works instead of the work of Jesus when he died on the cross. That's a form of following after the flesh. But you still can engage in fleshly things when you allow the world to speak to you and to fill you up. And when you do that, you invite problems in your life. You're inviting problems in your life. So just as the children of Israel were enculturated by the Egyptian culture, the world around them, the children of God today can also be enculturated by the world around them. And then mm -hmm. in the modern church, the modern church is opening up its doors and changing everything and bringing the world into the, into the sanctuary. Amen. So it's getting even worse. 
watering down the word of God because we don't want to offend people and we're worried we can't grow the church. That is not the ways of God. It's to speak the truth of God's word. So listen, until a person is born again and the spirit of God comes to live in them, there is no way for them to know the difference between the old man that was born in Adam and the new man that was born again in Jesus. And once we're born again, the process of gaining that understanding and the practice of what it means to be a Christian begins. Real quick, I'm closing with this, I promise. Two times in the New Testament that the word conformed or molded is used. One time it's in Romans chapter 12, and the other time it's in Romans 8. The first time it's used in a negative sense. The second time it's used in a positive sense. So in the English the word's the same, but in the Greek it's not. All right. In Romans chapter 12 verse 2, if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, if not I'm going to read it for you. It says, be not conformed to this world. So if you listen to worldly music and you allow it to enculturate you, I'm breaking this down a whole lot better than most preachers you heard talk to you while y'all are not listening to worldly music. You got you to gotta admit it. I'm, I'm breaking it down for you. If you choose to listen to worldly music and you allow that message to get on the inside of you, what this word conformed means in Romans chapter 12, when it says, be not conformed to the world, it, this is what it means in the Greek. To be fashioned, to be fashioned like unto something else. To be fashioned like unto another pattern. To be molded outwardly, to be made to look like something else around you. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that if you listen to that stuff enough, and you allow yourself to be exposed to that stuff enough, it's going to start to mold you. Don't tell me that it won't. Don't tell me that it won't. Because I know for a fact that the more you stay in the world, the more it's going to mold you and look, make you look like the world. He says, don't you be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. My third point was you're no longer ignorant. Listen to me. Your mind can be renewed to the truth of God's word. Instead of being enculturated by the world, we are to be enculturated by the word of God. We are to have a desire like a baby desires milk to desire the word of God, that it would be placed on the inside of us and the word transformed literally means to take on an outward expression of something that's already in you. Amen. It's the same word as Romans chapter 8 verse 29 where it says, those whom he foreknew, he predestinated them to be conformed into the image of Christ. The word in the Greek is morphe and it means to take upon an outward form of something that's already on the inside of you. That's deep stuff. Yeah. What does that mean? I said it 10 times now. When you get saved, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. That's right. When you become transformed because you begin to understand the ways of God and how God works, how he works in your life. Next thing you know, what's on the inside of you <coughs> starts to show outside of you. Mm -hmm. When you become conformed into the image of Christ, it means what's on the inside of you starts to come outside of you. Hallelujah. In the process of sanctification, the saint <coughs> is transformed in his inner heart life to resemble the Lord Jesus. And that inner change is now being manifest on the outside. You know, I used to have an old preacher. He was a young preacher, but he, used to, but he was my old preacher. And he, he used to say this, that grace is an inside job. Grace is the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of your heart that begins to reflect outwardly. Amen.